Hi, I would like to apologize in advance for being about to subject you to my absolute dumbass humor. Um, this shall be your only warning. It is a cause of some upset to me that many societies, historically and currently, chronically underestimate and undervalue textile production. Despite tens of thousands of years of technological advances and refinement. Now, a lot of that has got to do with the textile industry having been largely dominated by women. But how dyed in the wool do you have to be to not only refuse to properly acknowledge the very material that keeps us dressed and thermoregulated? but also ignore the many ways we find textile references interwoven with our daily speech. Indeed, the social fabric of our society would quickly unravel if the knowledge of the making of cloth vanished tomorrow. And yet, a great deal of intangible knowledge is already hanging by a thread as our older generation is steadily passing away. But, Quick-witted people in the past have also shrewdly managed to use the general ignorance of their crafts to their advantage. One of the most famous, perhaps, is Queen Penelope in the Odyssey, who bought herself three years from the hassle of suitors when her husband was thought to be dead. She did this by saying that she would meet with her suitors only when she had finished weaving a burial shroud for her father-in-law. Every day she would work on the shroud and every night by a lantern light she would unravel her work again, leaving the men none the wiser. The inverse of this misunderstanding of the craft is also true though. In the second millennium BC, Lamasi the wife of some Assyrian merchant, wrote to chide her husband for demanding too many fabrics to sell, reminding him, as one does, that the members of the household, such as the children, also required cloth for various things and that she couldn't just send him everything she wove for resale. When you think of it though, it really is ironic that fabrics have been so routinely dismissed and left to fade away by archaeologists searching for harder and shinier riches. In medieval England, wool was the most valuable crop as demand for textiles was rising. Anyone with land had sheep, and unlike today, the fleece was the most valuable crop much more so than the meat. It funded the church, the monarchs, and a great number of wars. It even ruined ecosystems, as King Edward I ordered the total extermination of all wolves in his kingdom in order to make the English countryside the perfect natural sheep farm. However, Animals were not the only creatures to suffer the greed of powerful landowners. By the mid-1800s in Scotland, the money in wool and cloth was so great that rather than take care of their tenants, the landowners would evict them and destroy their dwellings in the quest for ever more land for sheep farming. And this has come to be known as the Highland Clearances causing both famine and displacement. The House of Medici as well, oft referenced in books, movies and video games as a big, powerful money-lending complex with political power to spare, started out first as textile traders within the Wool Guild of Florence. So in many ways, we may not even have the glorious art of famous artists like Botticelli, Michelangelo and Donatello, if not for the wool industry. Not to mention how, before it became common to pay one's taxes in coin, many families would pay their taxes in wool, both thread and cloth. Again, I really cannot overstate 
the importance of the textile industry historically and how it is impossible to tear it away from politics and power. Even Shakespeare, wordsmith bar none, left us this glorious textile-based burn in Love's Labours Lost. He draweth out the thread of his verbosity, finer than the staple of his argument. Which we should totally write more textile burns. If you have one, let me know. But yeah, the textile industry is really important and has been throughout history. It has given us threads of thought and computer interface. It led authors like Arthur Conan Doyle to refer to particularly messy and complicated problems as a tangled skein. And I think we've all heard of the media executives lining their own pockets while overstretched writers and actors are striking because they are getting fleeced for their work. Meanwhile, we as viewers are left on tenterhooks, wondering whether the company's refusal to negotiate could risk another season of certain incredible shows. But striking and sabotage itself has proud roots in the textile industry. The word sabotage, which is only about a hundred years old, comes from the French term sabot which were these wooden clogs commonly worn by rural people. But from Sabo, the French also had an already established term of saboteur, or to bungle or walk noisily in said wooden shoes. A popular myth states that as the jacquard loom gained in popularity and cost people jobs, people started throwing their sabots into the loom to disrupt them as a form of protest. But there are no actual records of any actual shoes being thrown into the looms. Instead, the term sabotage was meant, as was already established in the French language at this point, to intentionally do something poorly, such that production was interrupted or slowed down to such a point that the textile mill owners would have to listen to the union's demands. And the term was so illustrative and vivid that it quickly spread to other languages. And this is not just my toe-headed self spinning up a tall tale based on threadbare arguments. Even the very language I am speaking can be unwrapped to reveal well-worn textile connections, where we might not have expected them. The word text and textile both share the common Latin root of texere, or to weave. Cut from the same cloth, we have the Latin word fabrica, or something skillfully produced, which supplies us with both fabric and fabricate. I particularly enjoy just how many words have come from the flax plant and linen cloth, hinting at its importance. Of course, we have linen itself, the lining of a good coat and the act of lining something, but also lingerie, line itself and even linoleum, although the latter was based on the oil of the linseed, not the fibers of the stem. My personal favorite though is subtle, which stems from the Latin prefix sub or under and tela meaning web, and it was originally a weaving term meaning finely woven or, you know, beneath the threads of the loom. It was only later that we started using the term to describe other things as well. So, in a way, subtle has become so subtle that we forgot the origin entirely. Even the word rocket is said to have come from the Italian word rocchetta, which in at least one region of Italy is supposed to mean little dye staff due to the shapes being similar. But 
My Italian is non-existent and my internet searches seemed to indicate that Rocchetta is also a place and or could mean a couple of different things. So any Italian viewers wish to confirm or elaborate? Not to air out dirty laundry, but cloth is actually such an old word that we do not know its ultimate origin or meaning, which is such a flex. But before this video descends into sheer madness, I thought we could unpick one theory about the song Pop Goes the Weasel. The first known version of the text published to a particular tune was in the 1850s by Miller and Beecham in Baltimore. There are a couple of different theories as to what Pop Goes the Weasel means exactly, but my favorite is of course going to be textile related. This is a spinner's weasel. It is a really clever contraption that helps make a run-of-the-mill skein of yarn. The little gear you see would usually be set up at a ratio of 40 to 1, so after 40 revolutions it would make a popping sound, letting you know that you have a skein with 80 yards of thread. So if you were to sell those skeins to other people, they would know that you were all wool and no shoddy since your skeins were always the same length. It is not all fun and games though. In typical colonialist fashion, English has also taken words like chintz, an artfully patterned calico textile from India that was popular in Europe from the 17th century, but as popularity waned throughout the end of the 20th century, chintzy came to be used in a derogatory fashion to mean something cheap or of poor quality, which is not at all a good way to respect a textile tradition of several hundred years of history. But the threads of fate compel me to mention one last thing before we patch up this video and call it a day. When you arrived on this earth in your birthday suit, several religions would have said your fate was already decided for you. And the Moriae of Greek, Parase of Roman, both known as the Fates in English, and the Norns of Norse mythology all have something to do with spinning and weaving. From the Greek, for instance, we had Clotho, who spun the thread of each person's life, Lachensis, who measured it, and lastly, Atropos, who cut the thread and thus inescapably decided the length of one's life. And most telling of all was that none could escape the fate of the fates. Not even the gods. They stood above, and when the spindle had spoken, well, oh, what a tangled web we weave. <laughs> oh, this is so dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, but also not sorry. And I could just keep going because I don't remember my script, but Queen Penelope features in it and I just want to talk animatedly so that we can add this as sort of a b-roll throughout to give a little bit of an illusion that we have multiple cameras.